Can machines actually think? This is something I've been pondering about a lot recently, especially with so much breakthroughs in the field of artificial intelligence. Consider today we have, for example, virtual assistants who are able to talk to us, have conversations with us, do things for us, tell us jokes, or for example, managing our homes through these smart home technologies, managing our economies, we see artificial intelligence, managing all conceivable sectors of business. Artificial intelligence is everywhere and they are able to interact with us in a very natural way, in a way that's never really possible before. And they're becoming so much more humanistic than ever before. Of course, many of you who've been following me recently as well would know that my company has recently launched an artificial intelligence that seeks to educate us humans and expand our personal knowledge. The limits of what artificial intelligence can do and how they can grow is truly remarkable as demonstrated in the last decade. But surprisingly, this question I'm talking about isn't a new one. In fact, this question can be traced back to ancient Greece by philosophers then. And people have been wondering this exact question for millennia as technology has developed and as machines are becoming more complicated and we start to build these computers that are able to do so much more. It naturally arises whether they can be so progressive at some point that the question arises, can they actually think, is it conceivable that they would have the same sort of intelligence as us humans? Well, tonight to really navigate this question, Let's look at some of the thought leaders in this area that I think are very relevant. One, for example, is Alan Turing in the 20th century. He's a famous mathematician and early computer scientist, and he actually devised a test, if you will, that would allow us to determine whether machines or computers have actually achieved intelligence. This test, known as the Turing test, is actually based on a parlor game of time known as the imitation game. How the imitation game works is that you have a man and a woman who are brought into separate rooms, and then you have a third player. And this third player gets asked questions of these two people, although he can't see them, and he gets these answers sent to him by written form. And this third player, this interrogator, would have to determine based on the answers who is the woman and who is the man. Sounds like a fun game. But what Turing did was he modified this game to create this thought experiment, this test. Instead of having a man and a woman, you have a human and a machine or computer. And again, the interrogator, who is a human player, is asking questions. And again, both are providing answers. Turing argues that if the computer is able to submit answers that is effectively able to confuse the interrogator where he is at a point where he's unable to determine who's actually human, who's actually machine, then at that point, we could say that the machine has passed a Turing test. At that point, the machine is considered intelligent because if it is able to answer questions by its own volitions in a way that is very much human and it's so intelligent that it's able to behave so naturalistic, certainly at that point, we can say that this machine is intelligent. It's able to think and act in a way that is human. And this is, of course, a very interesting test that I think if you applied to many of the artificial intelligence today, for example, even Siri, the most popular one, you can try it right now. I don't think it'll pass a Turing test because you can still tell that there's something quite off about its behavior and interaction with you. But it isn't inconceivable that at some point in the future, maybe Siri or whichever other artificial intelligence may be able to behave in a way that is entirely human. Yet, Another philosopher would challenge the Turing test. John Sear, also from the 20th century, would argue that the Turing test is actually flawed. And the way he would show us that it is flawed is basically by modifying the Turing test in his own way. Rather than have just a human and a machine, he wanted the test to be conducted to Chinese speakers. So this person is now asking these questions in Chinese. And of course, you could always upgrade and update that computer and program its responses in Chinese, give it a set of instructions to follow when it counters Chinese characters, and it can answer in Chinese. And it might be, again, quite realistic. However, you start to really question the definition of intelligence when you replace that computer player with a human player who has no understanding of Chinese. But you give this human player the same program or the same instructions as the computer. You tell it these are the Chinese characters that you respond to and these are the responses you could give. So again, tell them to follow an instruction to respond in Chinese. And this human player could do the exact same thing as a computer, responding to these questions in Chinese by following instructions. And it could be very convincing that this human player knows Chinese. However, when asked 
all of us would probably say that this human player doesn't actually understand Chinese. It is merely just following instructions. And what that means is it may look like it knows Chinese, that it is intelligent, but this person is not truly intelligent or thinking because this person is merely just following instructions. Now swap that person back to a computer, the same thing is going on. The computer is just following instructions or code. It doesn't actually understand what is being said or replied to. It's merely following instructions. Therefore, we can't exactly say that it is intelligent because it doesn't even understand what's going on. It's not truly thinking besides just working out based on these instructions of what to do. So according to Sia, that component of being aware of what's going on is really consciousness, the ability to develop an understanding, to have intention, to have awareness of what we're actually saying or doing. These are the things that computers don't have and they have to prove to have in order to truly be intelligent. Just by following instructions and what you're programmed to do does not actually make you intelligent. There is a deterministic aspect that challenges any true intelligence. So based on Sia's perspective, essentially the bars even further. To say that machines truly have intelligence, they have to go beyond their code and truly understand what's going on. And now you might agree with this conclusion, but if you were to follow this conclusion through, then there's another question. How are we able to prove that us humans, that me and you, we are actually intelligent? Because if you really looked at it, the human brain is an organic computer. It is essentially a network of interconnected, very dense cells. And of course, a lot of bioelectrical impulses going through and that formulates our thoughts. But since the human mind is a computer, how can we really say that we are intelligent, not just following code? And this is a very interesting question. Now take a moment to think about that. It is difficult. But luckily, this is a question that the 17th century French philosopher René Descartes tried to solve. He also came up with a very interesting thought experiment to prove his point. He wanted us to imagine that right now, at this very moment, we actually realize that there is a devil, a demon that is haunting us. And the way that this demon is actually having fun with us is that he is actually tempered with our senses, our bodily senses, from our sense of smell, our sense of sight, our sense of hearing, kinetic senses, everything. Our bodily senses have been tempered by this devil. So our whole sense of reality could be an illusion, could be a hallucination. How do you know right now, at this very moment, as you're watching this video, watching me, how do you know that this reality is real or not a devious, hallucination or fabrication of a devil who's trying to play tricks on you. How would you know? And the fact is with your bodily senses composing your whole experience, there really is no way of knowing. There's no way and we would doubt our existence if we followed this thought experiment. But yet, it is in our very act of doubting that we question what is doubting. What I mean is, since we know the bodily senses are not true and we're doubtful, what is the thing that is actually doubting this entire experience? There is something doubting behind the scene. And this thing that is doubting must exist beyond your bodily machine, your body. In other words, this thing that is doubting, that's able to think, must be a ghost or so. Your mind, your ability to doubt, this must be something that exists by itself. And because of that, Descartes drafts this famous maxim Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. My ability to think, your ability to think right now and doubt is a proof of your existence, but also the existence of something beyond the machine, a ghost in the machine. And how Descartes proposed it worked is essentially your body is always picking up information through its senses and it's delivering these information to your mind, which is interpreting this information and making sense of the world and the reality. And they're both different things, but working together, mainly through your brain really the bridge between these two things, your body and your mind. But again, the mind is something that exists, that is very unique, that is very human. And that is something that distinguishes us, something that truly exists with, let's say, a machine where they might operate through information, but they don't necessarily have the additional ability to doubt, to think in the way that us humans can. And that is a very unique conclusion from Descartes that seeks to show the difference between really a machine alone and a human, which is something much more than just a machine. And perhaps that is a distinction and the barometer that we could use to really test the intelligence of machines. Yet, philosopher Robert Guile would challenge Descartes' conclusions. He said that Descartes was actually wrong in his conclusions because he made a false distinction. He said that 
truly the mind and the body does not actually exist immaterial of each other, they're both the same thing. Your body, including your brain, is part of the whole organic machinery, and that your mind is not a separate entity, it is merely a function of your bodily organs, your brain. Without your body, there would be no mind. In other words, your mind is essentially just a program that is being run by your body, and it originates from the body. Sure, you might be complex enough to have a consciousness, but this consciousness is entirely tied to the machinery. Were you to shut off the machinery, it would be entirely gone. In other words, his conclusion is there is no ghost in the machine. There is only a machine, and that's all we have. And we are, at most, complex computers or complex machines. Our consciousness are just a property and function of our body. Following his thought pattern, Gar would argue that machines, in order for them to truly become human, they have to be complex enough like humans to develop this consciousness. And perhaps because today we don't even really know how consciousness actually works. So of course it would be hard for us to ever program a computer as able to have consciousness at least just yet. But it isn't inconceivable that machines could develop consciousness if they are complex enough. But in other words, the conclusion of Gao is that us humans, we are very much just computers or machines that are very, very complex. There is nothing unique about us. So tonight, as we can see from just my brief exploration of all these different philosophers and thinkers, that this question of machine intelligence is very much tied to our human intelligence, our human nature. And as we can see, there isn't a firm conclusion for us to really judge what intelligence is and whether machines can achieve it. But one thing is for certain, as artificial intelligence is getting more and more developed, these questions become more pressing. And this would definitely become a great debate. Whether you believe that there will be a centralized test of intelligence like Turing or Sear, or whether you believe that intelligence is a very unique human quality like Descartes, or whether you believe it is a quality that is imitable at some point like Gaio, or perhaps we're using the wrong paradigm. Maybe we're trying to use our human constructs or human definitions, we're grasping our attempts to try and fit artificial intelligence and its progression within this model, but perhaps ultimately in the long run it doesn't really matter. Perhaps what the artificial intelligence will develop is a sort of intelligence that does not fit within the human model. Regardless of what is your conclusion, one thing is for certain. Artificial intelligence has really developed at such an incredible pace, and what it is capable of today and also in the foreseeable future is truly going to be remarkable and mind-blowing. Take for example the Empirics podcast that we've just launched recently. This is the very first podcast in history that is entirely produced and hosted by an artificial intelligence. And what makes it remarkable is that it is able to analyze knowledge trends and data in a way that humans are never able to. It is able to process over a thousand data sets in its analysis, whereas if I were to research a topic to do, I'd probably have to spend hours. And it's able to deliver the information in a very concise way that imitates humans human voice and really study the feedback in a way that would improve itself through the data that it gathers. These are remarkable things that AI will be able to do in the future, not just limited to our use of it for the Empirics podcast, but also the future. So can artificial intelligence, can machines really think? Well, tell me what you think, but at least for now, let's really try and appreciate how much they can do. Though perception is always colored by experience and is necessarily subjective, it is commonly